Several years ago, um, J. Ligon Duncan, who is now the president of my alma mater, Reformed Theological Seminary, was asked by a reporter, what does Reformed Christianity believe? To which Duncan replied, we believe that God saves sinners. We believe that God saves sinners. Many Christians would give hearty agreement to that statement, but not really completely believe it. Again, we believe that God saves sinners, not that God helps sinners to be saved, not that God assists sinners to be saved, not that God and sinners work together in order for the sinner to be saved, but truly, truly, that God alone himself saves sinners. Which, by the way, is the greatest news a sinner could ever hear. I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 2. We are taking a break this morning from our ongoing study in Romans. This is Reformation Sunday for us. Ephesians chapter 2, and I would like to read the uh, first 10 verses. Uh, and we're turning here because there is no place in all of Scripture where the truth that God saves sinners is made more clear than in these verses. Would you join me as we stand together for the reading of God's holy and errant infallible word? Beginning at verse 1, and you, by the way, that's you and me. It's been every you since the beginning of time, since Adam's fall. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest, that is us, before Christ. Dead, worldly, children of wrath, disobedient, children, children of, uh, of the flesh, children of the mind, the fleshful mind, universal truth. And then verse 4, but God, being rich in his mercy, and I will emphasize the pronouns, because of his great love, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our and transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing richness of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are, Christians are, you are, I am, his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, this morning we pause and we reflect on your great saving work. Your great saving work that, that uh, was promised in the Old Testament, was fulfilled in the New Testament through Jesus Christ and heralded to the world through the apostles and then lost in darkness. Lost. And by your grace again, rediscovered during the Reformation. And we stand here today as Christians, not only in the light of what you promised in the Old Testament, in the light of what Christ accomplished, in the light of what the apostles proclaimed, but also in the light of the gospel rediscovered at the time of the Reformation. We thank you, Father, for your grace, your salvation, your Son, our Savior. And as we think this morning about the Reformation, we do pray that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear, hearts to believe. I specifically pray for that person here today who has never trusted in Christ completely as unto salvation. 
I pray, Lord, that you would open their eyes, again, make their hearts soft and tender to the truth. We pray that you'd be glorified this morning, that your son would be exalted and lifted on high, that everything else we thought about this week would fall to the wayside, and that there would be one great trophy of grace, and it would be Jesus. Again, we pray that this morning we would not just be confronted, but conformed, not just um, um, not just challenged, but changed. And we do pray for the one who preaches, get him out of the way, that Christ might alone be exalted in our midst. And we ask these things in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. amen. Please be seated. Again, if you're not familiar with Grace, you're visiting first time, been coming a while. Um, every year, our church takes the first Lord's Day, one Lord's Day each year, to remember, to uh, learn from one of the most important historic events, a God-wrought event, and that event is called the Reformation. Uh, we do so on the Sunday either before or on October 31st, because it was on October 31st in 1517 that the Reformation was launched, the day when a... Roman Catholic monk by the name of Martin Luther nailed what was called his 95 Theses uh, to the castle door in Wittenberg, Germany. And when Luther wrote that 95 Theses, it really was a catalyst that eventually affected the entire world. Our country in its founding is a product of the, of the 15th century Reformation. Like a stone thrown into a pond, those concentric circles spread throughout the Western world, the resounding effects of the rest of Reformation. And I can say this unequivocally that the effects of the Reformation are both historically and internal, eternally inestimable. Who knows how much effect it had? When Luther, back in 1517, as a Catholic monk and scholar, both a both a a local pastor in the Catholic world, as well as a scholar teaching at the Wittenberg Castle, when he nailed his 95 theses to the castle door there, that event wasn't particularly significant. The act wasn't particularly significant. In fact, nailing, uh, nailing such a theses to a door of a university was actually a customary thing at the time. It was a means by which scholars could challenge other scholars in the academic community to a debate. Luther was calling for a debate. And the debate he was calling for was on the, 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 the relatively new and, and, and urging, surging practice of selling indulgences. To give you a little bit of background at this time, Pope Leo X is the Pope over the Catholic Church, Roman Catholic Church. He, has, he is at this time building St. Peter's Basilica, a massive project, if you've ever been to, to Rome and the Vatican and all of that. And there is also at the same time a cardinal named uh, Albert Brandensburg, who wants to be the archbishop over not just one place, but over two places, unheard of. He wants to be the archbishop of Mance. He wants to be as well the archbishop of Magdeburg. And he goes to the Pope, Pope Leo says, I want both of these areas. And essentially Pope Leo says, I'm building St. Saint, uh, Saint, uh, Saint Peter's Basilica. And he says to Cardinal Brandenburg, he says, essentially show me the money, show me the money. And Brandenburg hires a man by the name of John Tetzel who begins to go through Ger Germany and other places selling indulgences. Now, to give you an idea, the, the Catholic Church had sold indulgences before. And indulgences were a way to, in Catholic theology, to cut the amount of time somebody spent in purgatory. And so, in the past, you could go to a, a relic, get some indulgences, go to a holy site, get some indulgences, climb on your knees up some stairs to some sacred building, get some indulgences, and they would cut maybe 100, maybe 1,000, maybe 2,000 years off time in purgatory. But Tutsal, because the money was big, 
was selling what was called plenary indulgences. That is to say, it took away all your time in purgatory. And the problem with selling plenary indulgences to living people is once you buy this indulgence, what happens the next time you sin? Everybody say amen. You went from no time in purgatory till the next second you commit a sin, commission, omission, you're back. And so Tetzel said, here's the idea. We won't sell it to the individual. We'll sell plenary indulgence to the individual's lost, deceased loved ones who are now in purgatory, who can't commit additional sin. And so Tetzel went selling indulgences. His motto was, as soon as gold in the coffer rings, a rescued soul from, from purgatory in heaven sings. And Luther said, that ain't right. That ain't right. Wrote his 95 theses, nailed it to the castle door, called for a debate. And in God's sovereignty, about 50 years before Luther did this, a German inventor by the name of Gutenberg had created the printing press in, of all places, Germany. And to put this in the vernacular, what, what really took place is Luther's 95 Theses went viral. Everybody got it? Went viral. The historian Alistair McGrath says that the Reformation was the rediscovery of the attractiveness of the gospel. And so just a handful of years after Christopher Columbus had discovered the Americas, God did a work in time and space that brought to light the rediscovery of the gospel. God brought light into a very, very dark world. God could have, like the time of Noah, flooded the world, but instead God in his grace brought the Reformation, the rediscovery of the gospel. If I were to give you a brief description or definition of the Reformation, I would say this, this is my own words, quote, the Reformation was a God-wrought rediscovery of the gospel and biblical Christianity across the entire Western world, led by a diverse group of God-ordained young, mostly Catholic scholars, end quote. And so when you think of the Reformation, yes, it began with Luther, 95 Theses in Germany, but it's spread throughout the Western world. There is not a Western country or area that you can think that was not dramatically affected by the Reformation. The Reformation gave us names like Luther and Zwingli, Calvin, Melanchthon, Gustav Vaza, Theodore Beza, John Wycliffe, Martin Bootser, Heinrich Bullinger, Martin Chemez, Andreas Karlstadt, Thomas Kramer, William Farrell, John Knox, Peter Martyr, uh, Felix Mance, Martin Munster, Jan Lansky, uh, Laurentius Pet Petri, I could go on and on and on. All these scholars almost simultaneously grasping the gospel and defending biblical Christianity. The word reformation means to straighten. To straighten that which is bent or crooked or twisted or distorted. And this morning I want to focus on the great product that the reformation gave us. And that is what we typically refer to as the five solas of the reformation. These are five points that rose out of the rediscovery of the gospel. Five points that distinguished biblical Christianity from that which was being taught by Rome. How am I going to do this this morning? I'm going to be real repetitive as in years past. Why? Because I know that so many people are not familiar with any of this. I was at a conference one. I was listening to John MacArthur and R.C. Sproul talking together and MacArthur was, and you may know John MacArthur, you may know R.C. Sproul, different backgrounds, but both became Reformed. But MacArthur was thanking Sproul for his role in bringing Reformed Christianity back to the church's consciousness. And Mark MacArthur, John MacArthur confessed that he himself, although he was raised by a father who himself was a, a prominent pastor in California, he never remembered, John MacArthur never remembered having a single conversation with his father about the Reformation. And MacArthur says this, and I quote, the Reformation wasn't a conversation, end quote. Here's a prominent, well-known pastor raised by another well-known, prominent pastor who had no idea that the Reformation even took place, nor what it produced. 
And so I want simply this morning to reintroduce or remind you of the five souls, old souls which in my mind uh, can never be lost, must never be lost. Why? Because eternity is at stake. How important were the five souls? The reformers themselves risked and even gave their own lives in, def in defense of these five points. The solas rediscovered a gospel that actually can bring about salvation. For me personally, if God gave me only one sermon to preach in my entire lifetime, or if I knew this was the last sermon I would ever preach, that sermon would be on the five points. The five points, as you look at the front of your bulletin, are sola gratia, grace alone, sola Christos, Christ alone, sola fide, faith alone, Sola Scriptura, Scripture alone, and Sola Dia Gloria, to the glory of God alone. So essentially this morning, I'm getting to either preach my only sermon or my last sermon. And since the first can't be hope, I'm really praying that the second isn't true either. <laughs> Let's jump in. First of all, Sola Scriptura, Scripture alone. By the way, in all of these words, Sola, the Latin word Sola means alone. That means by itself, unaccompanied, no addition, no addendum, none of that. Sola Scriptura means scripture alone. Sola Scripture was called by the reformers, listen to this, the formal principle of the Protestant Reformation. That is to say, it is this principle upon which the other principles rest and arose. When the reformers turned to the scriptures, they did so as the sole authority on spiritual things alone. They found in the scriptures what God had said, what God had spoken, which was quite different from what the Roman church was teaching. Sola Scriptura was the formal principle. And again, the, the reformers believed there was, a, there was a motto that rose out of the Reformation among the reformers was ad fontes. And it meant literally back to the fountains, not secondhand sources, but back to the fountains themselves, the scriptures. You can turn there or allow me to read it. Familiar text, 2 Timothy 3, 13 and following, where Paul writing to Timothy says, but evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you, however, continue in the things that you've learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them and that from childhood, you have known, listen, that the sacred writings, which are able to give you wisdom that leads to the salvation through faith in Christ Jesus, and that all scripture, is inspired of God, profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate and equipped for every good work. Sola Scriptura. You see, the Roman church at the time of Luther would have also acknowledged the scriptures to be authoritative. But they also would have looked to the church itself, to church tradition. Some of them were very, very much committed to human reason. It was the age of enlightenment, human reason. They also looked to the Pope as the sole source. They looked to the magisterium, which was the ruling of the popes and the bishops and so forth. So yes, the Catholic Church at the time of Luther said, yeah, we believe in the authority of scripture, but also popes and magisteriums and tradition and reason and all of that. It's the scripture plus other things. And the reformer said, no. God's word is the only authority. And soul of scripture therefore became the affirmation that scripture alone, not the church, not religious tradition, not personal experience, which is a big thing in our culture. I experienced it, therefore it must be true. None of that. The sole authority for Christian faith and practice is the scriptures. We understand from scripture that God is transcendent and remains completely hidden from our eyes. And unless and until... He reveals himself to us, he is unknown, and that God alone has determined to reveal himself alone through his word alone. And by the way, there is no one who affirms sola scriptura, scripture alone, more than Jesus Christ himself. So many times throughout the scriptures, for instance, Matthew 21, 42, Jesus said, have you not read the scriptures? Or for instance, Matthew twenty two thirty nine. do you not understand the scriptures? 
or he'd explain some. This is taking place in order to fulfill the scriptures. The chief authority, Christ, saw the scriptures. And again, what distinguished the, the Roman church and reformers at the time of the reformations was that the Roman church believed that the scriptures were authoritative, plus other things. The, the reformer says scripture alone with nothing else. Luther, in fact, said this quote, while popes and councils err, scripture alone does not err, end quote. You see, in the early days and years of the Reformation, the key issue was really the issue of authority. Who has authority over the church? Who has authority over lives? Who has the right to rule and reign in terms of truth? The pope, the councils, authority became the big issue. And if you study carefully the history of the Reformation, you will discover that Luther's earliest debates took place with Roman scholars sheerly over the issue of authority. And of course, the Roman scholars argued, oh, the Pope is authority. Some said he's the highest authority. Some would even say that the Pope's understanding of the scriptures is authority. Luther and other reformers said, no, 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 no. And again, this is called the formal principle because, listen, apart from sola scriptura, there would be no reformation. Because every other truth that came out of the reformation rose out of the truth of scripture alone. Question. How did the reformers come to understand that the scriptures or the Bible was the sole authority? How did they come to that idea? How did the reformers come to understand sola scriptura, the scriptures alone? How did they come to that idea? And the reformers believed, and this is so important, they believed that the scriptures were, here's the key word, self-authenticating. The scriptures were self-authenticating. That is to say that the scriptures proved themselves to be what they claimed to be, the word of God. Not just, listen to this, the Bible is the word of God because it claims to be the word of God. That's circular reasoning. It is because it says it is. Not just because it claims to be, but rather the Bible is the word of God because it proves itself to be the word of God. You say, how does that happen? How, how can the Bible be self-authenticating? How does the Bible prove itself to be the word of God? Now, we go to a lot of lesser ideas. For instance, we might say something like this. We know the Bible is the word of God because how about this one? How about because of fulfilled prophecies? The Bible would say something happens, and guess what? It happens. Pretty powerful, huh? Pretty powerful. Or maybe we say, well, we know the Bible proves itself to be the word of God because of its, of its, uh, of its um, treatment of history. The Bible says this is what's going to happen. Sure enough, it's what happens. This is what the Medes, Medes do. This is what the Persians do. This is what the Romans did. And sure enough, that's what they did. But actually, the reformers' idea of the self-authenticating nature of the word of God is much more profound than just that. Let me give you an idea. I'll use the English reformer or Puritan John Owen. John Owen said this, quote, only, listen carefully, only what is not light needs light to be known. Say that again. Only what is not light needs light to be known. But light, Owen went on to say, makes itself manifest. You don't need light to see light. Light itself makes itself known. On the other hand, Everything else other than light needs light to be made known. If I could snap my fingers and I could create abject perfect darkness in this room, I wouldn't know if you're here or not. You could have stayed home. Wouldn't know what's here, nor would you. But when the light comes on, guess what's made known? Everything's made known. The only thing in the world that doesn't need light to be made known is light itself. Like light, the reformer said, the word of God proves itself to be the word of God by being simply 
what it is. Think how much we know because the word of God is light that we wouldn't know apart from the scriptures. <clears throat> Satan knows this. In fact, in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, it says this, the God of this world, that Satan, has blinded the mind of the unbelieving so they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Jesus Christ, who is the image of God. Reformers believe the light of scripture reveals to us what we would never know apart from it. The true knowledge of God, the true knowledge of self, true knowledge of sin, true knowledge of salvation, true knowledge of this world, true knowledge of the unseen world, true knowledge of so much that we wouldn't know apart from Scripture. And all of a sudden, that which is in darkness and unknown is made known to us solely through the Scriptures because Scripture is what? Light. Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 1.5, concerning the Bible, it says this, it doth, the Bible doth abundantly evidence itself to be the word of God. It says what it actually is. Again, the importance of soul of scripture is out equal in the Reformation. We, they understood the, the Bible to be the revelation of the very mind of God. Calvin in his institute said this, since no daily responses are given from heaven, that is that God is not speaking from heaven all the time, and that the scriptures are the only record in which God was pleased to consign his record to a perpetual remembrance to all generations, that is. The full authority with which the scriptures ought to possess the faithful is not recognized unless they are to believe to have come from heaven directly. Calvin goes, as if God had, God had been heard giving utterance to them, end quote. The very, very word of God. Luther said this, you must follow straight after scripture, accept it and not speak even one syllable against it because, Luther said, it is God's mouth. Luther wrote in 1533, the word of God is the great and most necessary and most important thing in all of Christendom. In 1545, Luther wrote, let a man who would hear God speak, read the scriptures, end quote. And again, for the reformers, sola scripture wasn't just a slogan, wasn't just a theological idea, it was a complete and utter commitment of life. They were all about the scriptures. For instance, between 1510 and 1546, Luther preached 3,000 sermons. You don't preach sermons, I do. That's amazing. 3,000 sermons. His average Sunday looked like this. He'd rise at 5 a.m. and exposit a New Testament epistle. At 10 a.m., he exposited one of the New Testament gospels. At noon, he instructed his children out of the scriptures. And then at 5 p.m., he exposited an Old Testament book. Week after week after week after week. Calvin, no different. Calvin preached five expository sermons each week. Five years of expository sermons in Acts, 46 sermons from 1 Thessalonians, 146 sermons from 1st 2 Corinthians, 159 expository sermons from Job, 200 plus expository sermons from Deuteronomy, 353 from Isaiah, 123 from Genesis, and on and on and on and on. In other words, they spent their lives declaring expositorily the scriptures. The Reformation, listen, gave us the Bible. The Bible in the common language of the people. The Bible translated into the people's languages. In the first 10 years, 10 years of the Reformation, more Bibles were printed and distributed, 10 years, than in the previous 1,500 years. Let me put it this way, since the time of Christ. Since the time of Christ. Second point. Sola Scriptura, Scripture alone. How about sola gratia? What's it mean? Everybody together? Grace alone. Luther wrote in a seminal work, The Bondage of the Will, that God has surely promised his grace to the humble, that is, to those who mourn over and despair of themselves. A man cannot be thoroughly humble till he realizes, listen to this, that his salvation is utterly beyond his own powers utterly beyond his own counsel, utterly beyond his own efforts, will, and works. This man then depends absolutely on the will, the counsel, the pleasure, and the work of another, namely 
God, Luther wrote. We began this morning in Ephesians 2, where we read in verse 7 and 8, or 7 through 9, so that in the ages to come, he, God, might show the surpassing richness of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not a result of anyone, lest no one, uh, so that no one may boast. That is to say, every saved Christian in eternity come will be above all things, listen to this, an eternal trophy of God's grace. An eternal trophy of God's grace. What is grace? Grace is not the prayer you say at dinner time, by the way. Some people have wrongly understood God's grace. Many have thought of God's grace in terms of an empowering on high. They envision God's grace as a divine enabler. They erroneously see grace as a thing, a thing that helps them to earn or cooperate with God's offer of salvation. That's not grace at all. Grace is not a thing. It's not some sort of empowering property. But rather, the reformer said that from the scriptures, grace is always declared to be solely, here it is, a disposition of God. Grace has to do with God's own nature, God's own character, God's divine constitution, a prevailing inclination of God himself. And what is it? Grace is God's disposition, listen to this, to bestow favor. What is God like? One thing we know about God is that he's gracious. What does that mean? God is inclined to bestow favor. To be gracious. You can't understand, by the way, you cannot understand God's grace. You can't understand that God in and of himself is generous and kind and helpful. God is a God of goodwill and favor. That's who he is. You can't understand that until you understand it to whom God dispenses this grace. And again, if you're still in Ephesians 2, and if not, turn there, you have to see this. To whom does God dispose himself in this way? We read over it, but it is amazing, isn't it? Ephesians chapter 2, again, verse 1, and you who were dead in your trespasses and sin in which you formerly walked according to this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, now the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience, among them too we all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. And then, verse 4, but God's grace. God's grace is seen most clearly in the idea of to whom God disposes this grace and to whom does he? The most unworthy people in the world. That's what makes God's grace so amazing. And the primary characteristic of those to whom God disposes his grace, verse 1, is they are in the Greek necros. They are dead. They are dead. Lifeless. Primary nuanced meaning. And this is such an important doctrine. If you get this one wrong, you get the entire gospel wrong. What does it mean to be dead? First of all, death, if you look at verse 1, the death that Paul is referring to is spiritual death, spiritual deadness. What kind of deadness? Spiritual deadness. Doesn't mean that you don't have physical life, you do, but you are spiritually dead. In fact, you'll notice verse 2 and 3 carefully, when it talks about spiritually dead people, of which we all are, it actually speaks of us with physical life. In verse 2, you'll see spiritually dead who are walking. Verse 3, spiritually dead who are living. Verse 3, spiritually dead who are indulging. You can be walking, living, indulging, physically alive, but be completely and utterly spiritually dead. Deadness to God and deadness to the things of God. Dead. Some people think grace is just the call. Some people have, 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 have even so, I've heard this many, many times, that God essentially <clears throat> woos us to himself. You ever heard that? As sinners, God, God woos us. 
You ever been through Disney's Pirates of the Caribbean? There's this one scene where these guys are on the other, these pirates are on the other side of the bars. And there's a dog on the other side with the keys in his mouth. Remember that? And the pirates are going, come on, come on, boy. That's what God does. Come on, sinner. Come on, sinner. Come on, sinner. Listen, it's not a dog wagging his tail with keys that are on the other side of the bars. You know what it is? It's a dead man. You can't woo a dead man to life. Everybody say amen. Secondly, death is not only spiritual deadness, but the death that Paul refers to is the evidence of our own trespasses and sins. If you look at Ephesians, I'm going to get technical once and just for a short minute, but Paul is painting a picture that is so huge about the deadness of our sin. The word dead in verse 1 of chapter 2 in the Greek is what we call the dative case. You don't have to remember that. The dative case deals with cause, sphere, and instrumentality. Essentially, what Paul says in verse 1 is that we are dead, and the thing that killed us was our trespasses and sins. The instrument that killed us, the weapon that killed us, was our own trespasses and sin. And our death and killing took place in the midst of our trespasses and sins our trespasses and sins was the cause of our death the instrument of our death and the location or spheres of our death we can say it this way that trespasses and sins killed me that's the cause and they killed me with my own trespasses and sins that's the instrument and my death took place in the midst of my own trespasses and sins the sphere dead to sin Dead to sin, cause, instrument, sphere, place, location, circumstance. And it is that person to whom God disposes grace. Isn't that the point? The point. Thirdly, sola scripture, scripture alone, sola gratia, grace alone, sola Christos. Christ alone. To quote from Acts chapter 4, verse 5 and following, just let me read it. On the next day, the rulers and elders, scribes were gathered together in Jerusalem, and Annas the high priest was there, Caiaphas and John and Alexander, and all who were of priestly descent. And when they placed them, Peter and John, in the center, they began to inquire, by what power and what name have you done this, that is, heal this man? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to him, rulers and elders of the people, if we are on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man as to how this man has been made well, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name, this man stands here before you in good health. It's not us. Peter goes on to say concerning Christ, he is the stone which you rejected. The builders, by which became the chief cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Christ alone. <clears throat> Christ alone. We move from grace alone to Christ alone. And basically what I'm saying is that grace has a face. Grace has a name, and it's Jesus Christ. Sola Christos declares that God's gracious disp uh, disposition towards spiritually dead sinners is only realized and demonstrated in one person, and that is Jesus Christ. Paul Titus, Titus 2.11 says this, for the grace of God has appeared, talk about the incarnation of Christ, brings salvation to all men. Christ alone. Christ alone. God perfectly revealed himself in Christ alone. God perfectly glorified himself in Christ alone. The fullness of God's grace is realized in Christ alone. The only way to know God, Christ alone. The only way of entering in relationship, God, Christ alone. The only way of being saved, God's wrath, Christ alone. The only way to heaven, Christ alone. Everybody, got, do I say that again? What's, what, what's the point? Christ alone. 
And guess what? Christ alone was considered the centerpiece of the five solas. I don't know how it's listed in the bulletin because I don't have one. But typically, when they're listed the five, Christ alone is always the middle one, the third of the five. And that was because whether you talked about scripture alone, grace alone, faith alone, glory of God, all of those, all of those pointed and terminated in the person of Jesus. Scripture, it's about Jesus. God's grace, realized in Jesus. Faith in Jesus. Glory of God, accomplished by Jesus. And let me say this before we move on. I'll be done real quick. I'm getting there. We're three, three or five. When we talk about Christ alone to us, it's not just the person of Christ, but you understand there's also a leaving in order to receive. You can't embrace Christ alone with other things in your arms because it's Christ, what's the next word? Alone. Trusting in Christ alone demands the abandonment of all other hopes, all other beings, any other confidence, any other trust, any other works, righteousness, charities, it's Christ alone. And when you add anything to Christ alone, it stops being grace. The hymn, Solid Rock, my hope is built on nothing less than what? Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust in any sweetest rain, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. <clears throat> on Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is what? Sink sand. Christ alone. Excuse me. <clears throat> Sola fide, faith alone. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that's not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not a result of works lest any man should boast. Saving faith is not only believing in Jesus Christ, it's also counting everything on just casting all your chips, betting everything about your salvation on Jesus Christ. That's what faith is. Calvin described the doctrine of justification by faith alone as the principal hinge on which Christianity is supported. Luther said it was the articulus stantius vel candidus. It is the article upon which this church stands or falls. Luther wrote concerning justification by faith alone, this article is the head and cornerstone of the church, which alone begets, nourishes, builds, preserves, and protects the church. Without it, the church of God cannot subsist for one hour, end quote. Faith alone. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry. Anyway, of the five, five articles, of, of these five points, it was Christ alone that was the boom, hot button for the Catholic Church. Why? Why? Because with the doctrine of Christ alone, the medieval church knew that if the biblical doctrine of sinners being justified by, by faith alone in Christ alone meant that Rome's whole enormously lucrative system of salvation with its Pope-centered, ecclesiastical-operated, priest-dependent, church-based religious works would collapse. In other words, Christ alone was the gauntlet. It was the point. In 1539, Calvin, during his debate with Cardinal Sadoloto, said justification by faith alone was the first and keenest subject of the controversy between us. Listen, let's not talk about anything else. This is what we need to talk about in this debate. Calvin argued if justification by faith alone in Christ is rejected, the glory of Christ is extinguished, religion is abolished, the church is destroyed, and hope of salvation is thoroughly overthrown for all sinners. And by the way, justification by faith alone, listen to me carefully, makes Christianity distinct from every other religion in the world. I remember years ago going through my bachelor's degree and you had to take world religions. Mm. And they missed the point when it came to Christianity. It is the only religion that believes in and rests upon divine accomplishment. Every other religion rests upon works, duty. Everybody's crossing T's and dotting I's. Christianity alone 
is a religion of divine accomplishment. All others, achievement, man preoccupied with his own effort, trying to earn God's favor. Christ alone, divine accomplishment. Salvation comes to us because of what somebody else has done alone. There are only two possible ways to approach God according to God's word, one that cannot save and one that does save. Romans 4, 4 and 5, now to the one who works his wage, not reckoned as a favor, but what's due, but to the one who does not work, but believes in him, who justifies the ungodly, his faith is reckoned as righteousness. Jesus said it simply, John 5, 24, he who hears my words and believes has passed out of death into life. No works, no sacraments, no rituals, no baptism, no aisles, no nothing. Christ alone. Let me read a longer text, such an important subject. Romans 3, 21 and following. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifest, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, listen, through faith. Through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. For there is no distinction. For all of sin falls short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift of his grace, there's grace alone. The redemption which is in Christ Jesus, there's Christ alone, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood. It was demonstrated his righteousness because in the forbearance of God he passed over sins previously committed for the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness in the present time so that he would be the just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. The gospel is simply this one God who saves sinners in one way, and that is by faith in one person, and that's Jesus. By the way, justification is a declaration of God whereby God credits you with the righteousness of Christ, not your own. When you place your faith in Jesus, God credits you with the perfect righteousness of Christ. God made him, Christ, who knew no sin, to become sin in your behalf so that you might become the righteousness of Christ in him. That is to say, when Jesus died on the cross, your sins were hung upon him. So that by faith, God would give his righteousness, credit his righteousness to you. God treated Christ on the cross as if he'd lived your life, my life. So by faith, God can look at us as if we have lived his life. Um, Sol fide, Christ alone. Finally, sola dia gloria, the glory of God alone. Why would God do all this? For his own glory. All of it. Scriptures, for his glory. His grace, for his glory. Send his son, Christ, for his glory. Faith alone, apart from works, for his own glory. It's all for the glory of God, not the church, not my glory, not your glory. The longer you're a Christian, you know what? I don't want any credit. I want to hide. May Christ God be glorified. Proverbs 16, 4 says, The Lord has made all things for himself. Romans eleven thirty six 36, For him and through him and to him are how many things? All things. To whom be the glory forever and ever. Ephesians 3, 24, or 3, 21, Unto him be the glory in the church by Jesus Christ through all ages, world without end. Amen. Let's pray together if we could. Father, it's truly shameful that Paul would have to remind us to not be ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God. Father, why do we why do we have this proclivity, this tendency? to be be ashamed of the gospel. Why are we ashamed of the simple truths of the gospel? Why would Rome confuse and cover it up? Why would the church today confuse and cover it up? Lord, I pray that this morning each and every one of us with Paul would resound, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I am not ashamed that sinners are saved by Christ alone by God's grace alone, by faith alone, according to God's grace alone, 
according to the scriptures alone, for your glory alone. It's so simple, but so profound. Lord, help this church to ever be reminded and mindful of and in defense of and declarative of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that you might be glorified. Father, someday we will stand before you by your grace because of faith in Christ, according to your word. And we will fully realize that you're the only one that will be glorified. We will fall before you as dead men, saved, but in great recognition of all that you are and all that you've done for us. We will fully see ourselves, as Paul declares, as your workmanship created in Christ Jesus. For the person here this morning who's never trusted in Jesus, I, I beg you, I implore you to believe upon him, to place the faith that God might give you, the repentance that God might grant you in Christ. Believe upon him, turn to him, and live. This world is so dark and deceptive, Father. It deceives us. The God of this world blackens our minds, tries to block the light, lies to us about our sin, and our eternal souls are on the line. Lord, may your grace prevail this morning in this place. May your grace prevail even as we meet for fellowship over the table. We thank you for the Reformation. We thank you for those those heroes of the faith who lived and died and preached and proclaimed and fought and did all they could do, um, sacrificed all they could sacrifice for the defense of the gospel. And here we sit in the land of the free and the brave, and sometimes, Father, we're so guilty of being silent, indifferent, unmoved. And yet nothing in this world is more important than the gospel of salvation, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now move our church to passion, Father. That's my prayer. We certainly sit here, Lord, looking at a world that's on fire politically, uh, militarily, economically. Uh, we are getting a grandstand view of the passing shortness, brevity of life and uh, of this world. And uh, we can clutch on it, cling on it, and it's all fading away. And will one day be burned up, all the elements, as your word says. And we need to make sure that we have built our life upon your son, our savior, Jesus. And help, help us, Father, give us the grace, the wisdom, knowledge to do that. Uh, we commit ourselves to you. We thank you for this time together of worship on this celebration of reformation. And we ask these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. I'm going to do the benediction, but again, everybody needs to go out this side of the building. On the very back of the building is where the food is, and there's seats and chairs and tables inside as well as outside. Before I do the benediction, I'm going to pray for our meal, and then I'll ask you to stand for the benediction. Father, again, we just thank you for this time of fellowship. We thank you for uh, the food and conversation that we'll share together, and we pray, Lord, that you would be glorified in all of it. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Would you join me as we stand? My brothers and sisters, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen.